NPR, news from New Hampshire and NPR, online at nhpr.org. Welcome to NHPR's Candidate Debate for New Hampshire's 2nd Congressional District. I'm Laura Canoy, host of The Exchange, along with All Things Considered host Peter Biello. These debates are produced in collaboration with New Hampshire PBS. And we're observing health guidelines while we bring them to you. All four of us, Peter, me, and our two candidates, are in separate studios here at NHPR. And all of us wore masks when we came into the public areas of the building today. Here's our format for the hour. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to deliver an overview opening statement. We'll then move to questions with 60 seconds to respond. In many cases, Peter or I will ask a follow-up question or a point of clarification, which will each get 30 seconds. And in the case of a direct attack on a candidate, that person will be given 30 seconds to respond. Our candidates are the incumbent Congresswoman Anne McLean Custer, first elected in 2012. Welcome back, Congresswoman Custer. Great to be with you, Laura and Peter. Thanks for having me. And also with us, Republican nominee Steve Negron, a businessman and former state lawmaker from Nashua. And Mr. Negron, a welcome back and a thank you as well. Well, thank you, Laura and Peter and Congresswoman Custer. Nice to see you, ma'am. Great to see you. And we'll start with that 30, uh, excuse me, 60 second opening statement. And we'll go in alphabetical order. So, Congresswoman Custer, go ahead, please. Your 60 second opening statement. Thank you, Laura and Peter and Steve. Great to be with you again. I just want to reach out to listeners and to viewers about these challenging times. This has been, honestly, probably the greatest challenge in our lifetime. And I think New Hampshire has stepped up. Granite Staters across the board have been so resilient. And I've been thrilled in the last few days to get a chance to visit some of those folks over in Keene and Peterborough and Claremont, seeing what small businesses did to step up. You're going to hear a lot of issues in the next hour, and um, Peter and Laura will do their best to pin my opponent down, but I'm going to be very clear about my record. I support health care for every single Granite Stater, and I want to improve upon the Affordable Care Act and make sure that you have access to affordable health care. I support your reproductive rights. I support your family and saving our planet. That's what's on the ballot. Thanks so much. Thank you, Congresswoman. And Mr. Negron, your 60-second opening statement, please. Well, thank you, Laura Laura Peter, and again, Congresswoman Custer. Um, This is truly going to be about um, the record of Congresswoman Custer. Um, And we're going to talk about those issues um, that I've seen and I've heard as I've talked to the folks um, throughout the great state of New Hampshire, specifically the 2nd Congressional District. You know, it is about those things that are that are important to to the Granite Staters, those things that we're wondering, you know, why do we still have this divisiveness that's happening in Congress? Why is there this gridlock that's happening in Congress? Why can't we put the ball forward and get some things done uh, for the great folks in New Hampshire? And throughout this next hour, we're going to talk about those things, and we're going to let the folks of the 2nd Congressional realize that now is about a change. Now is about change that I think that you need to have a voice down in Washington that truly represents um, the folks of New Hampshire and not those of a political party or a political leaning. And so I'm looking forward to a spirited and respectful debate. Um, once again, I'm glad to be sharing the stage again with Congresswoman Custer. I'm um, looking forward to a great hour. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Negron. And both of you, let's jump into questions and start with the pandemic. As you said, Congresswoman, a huge, huge challenge for everyone. Mr. Negron, starting with you, the United States has a little more than 4% of the world's population, but has 20% of the world's COVID-19 cases. Name two specific steps that you think the federal government, I'm talking about the president and Congress, should have taken to mitigate this. And you have 60 seconds for this one, please. Sure. Thank you, Laura, for the question. Well, it's clear that once the president realized what was happening um, and he shut down flights in from China, um, it's unfortunate that on that same day that um, Congress was pending impeachment articles um, and had kind of like a fanfare kind of event. Look, I believe um, I, re- I respect this virus. Um, I'm not afraid of this virus. Um, There are situations that are out there that we know that we have a population that we need to protect. Once we knew that that population um, of our older citizens were more, uh, uh, in fact, uh, at risk, we should have done some things to protect those clearly, Um, especially here in New Hampshire. We should have done some things to protect uh, assisted living facilities. Um, But I think the president has done and this administration has done the things that they want to put forward. Um, I think Congress has been an obstacle for a lot of things, especially when it comes to funding uh, to get some things. I think the first round of funding uh, created a big uh, hub of because of things that were not in there. So I think we should have been more targeted with our resources to try and help people specifically that are affected by this pandemic. Well, and we definitely have some questions about 
the health aspects of this and the funding. But to your point about what the president has done, as you know, he has often ignored the advice of his own scientists, uh, avoiding masks, holding large gatherings. People are close together. Then, as you know, he himself got COVID, as did a widening circle of staff at the White House and people around him. What kind of example, Mr. Negron, does this set? And 30 seconds, please. Sure. Well, I attended the president's last rally here in Manchester where we were that at the airport, and not a single case of COVID-19 um, came out of that. And it was a wide area, a lot of people uh, gathering, and there were some people with masks and some people without I think what the president is showing is that, you know, we have individual responsibilities that are out there. We need to understand what the situation is. And we as individuals should make that decision for ourselves. I'm clearly protecting those people that are high risk. So I think the president is doing exactly the same thing that I did, for example, at that rally. In your own campaign, Mr. Negron, your website and social media pages show lots of photos of supporters at events uh, in very close proximity with very few wearing masks. And I wonder what health protocols are you following in your campaign? Sure. 30 well, seconds. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, certainly anybody that works in a campaign office, we've been around each other sometimes a little bit too much, but we've always been around each other. Um, so we know each other's health uh, protocol. Anytime we go out, if I go to talk to a senior citizen center, I'm wearing a mask. Um, so I take the information that I gather. I do my own research. I figure out where I'm going. Um, and to this date, um, not one person that's been associated with my campaign or any rally that I've been to has come down with COVID-19. So I think we're doing the right things. Thank you, Mr. Negron. And Congresswoman Custer, to you, pretty much the same question I asked Mr. Negron. The U.S. has a much higher percentage of COVID cases than almost any other country. You've been in Congress for eight years. So what are two specific steps that lawmakers now, not the president, but lawmakers should have taken to avoid this catastrophe? And you have 60 seconds here. Well, it is the failure of leadership at the top, Laura. It's coming from the White House and the lack of example. And it's no surprise that over 35 people con contracted this virus and are infected, including the president of the United States. Congress did take steps immediately through the CARES Act, and I'm very proud of the work that we did to bring $4.2 billion to New Hampshire. There's more that can be done, and that's the HEROES Act, and it's the U.S. Senate that's failed to vote for that and the president that's failed to support it. So both sides need to come together. This is aid that people here in New Hampshire need, both individuals and families and small businesses. Uh, like the loan that Mr. Negron took, a PP loan. We have 24,000 loans here in New Hampshire. 22,000 of them are under $150,000, and we should be streamlining that process. I voted for that. That's something we could do. And we could do a lot more in terms of both the testing, national testing policy, and then I'd love to get into the vaccines if we have more time. Well, and to that point, um, Congresswoman Custer, many who work in public health say the U.S. has long underinvested in public health, long before the Trump administration, including under President Obama. What should Democrats, including you, a long time ago have done to make our public health system more durable so it would be more ready for a thing like this? We've 30 always seconds, supported the funding for public health, and I think the problem was that we didn't have the leadership from the White House in terms of the contact tracing. That's what we knew we needed to do. I put out a roadmap to recovery that spelled out testing, contact tracing, supported isolation. That's how you get a handle on COVID-19. We worked with the governor. I think in New Hampshire, where we had a very bipartisan approach, a federal congressional delegation and a, the Republican governor working together behind the scenes really worked out and our numbers were low. But in other parts of the country, in red states, the numbers go up and up and up. Well, and related to the president's diagnosis, um, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, as I'm sure you know, recently announced that because of the White House's withholding of information about the president's COVID status over the last 10 days or so, she was seeking to establish a commission under the 25th Amendment, which allows Congress or the cabinet to intervene if a president is unable to conduct his duties do you support this 25th Amendment initiative by the Speaker? And you have 30 seconds, please. Absolutely. I think all the American public saw it. Not only was the president incapacitated and taken to the hospital by this virus, but furthermore, he was taking very powerful steroids. And anybody that watched his Twitter account over the five days of those steroids could tell he wasn't in his right mind. And so I think it's very important that we have an alternative. This is the person who has their finger literally on the bottom. Button, the nuclear uh, button. And I think 
there was a threat to our country, and it's very important to have an alternative. Laura, if, if I may, this is— this 30 is, seconds, Mr. This McGrawn. is absolutely yes. part of this political persecution that this 116th Congress has, uh, has perpetuated. You know, there's no diagnosis um, from anybody from Congress about these steroids and what the effect is on the president. Um, we do have a secession of power. It's clearly delineated. Um, and you know what? It, it's it's sad that we have a congresswoman that wants to perpetuate this this false narrative about that our president is incapacitated. You know they try to do that with the impeachment, and they're trying to do this now with the Twenty Fifth Amendment. That's not who New Hampshire wants as a congressperson. They want somebody that's going to understand what the Constitution has, and to be able to continue this political persecution, I think, is is wrong and disingenuous. Thank you both. Back to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Laura. Let's switch now uh, and talk about the economy. Uh, and we'll go first to you, Congresswoman Custer. President Trump, after calling off relief talks with Congress and encouraging the Senate to focus on the confirmation hearings of uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett, uh, he has now said that he's open to negotiating uh, with Democrats. Two major topics of debate include uh, another round of $1,200 stimulus checks and more relief to the airline industry. Congresswoman Custer, uh, what economic relief are you prioritizing? 60 seconds. Well, the number one issue, and I was so surprised when my opponent said that he didn't uh, believe that running for federal office had any impact on the state budget. The most important issue in the negotiation is what we call state and federal, and it would be eight hundred million dollars coming to the state of New Hampshire, not just for the response, the cost of the response to COVID, but more importantly, <clears throat> excuse me, the lost revenue in the rooms and meals tax, and we had a 90% drop in our tourism and hospitality. That is a tremendous hole in our state budget. When our state legislature reconvenes in January, it's one in five dollars, 20% of our budget, and those would be massive cuts. So it's absolutely critical that we get this passed, the HEROES Act, get it over the line, bring everyone together, and in the meantime, the U.S. Senate is just focused on ramming through this Supreme Court nomination, not taking the time to provide the relief that this country needs. Uh, Congresswoman Custer, the deficit has risen sharply in the past few years, in part due to COVID-19 relief aid. How do you plan to reduce the deficit and ensure that the government lives within its means while also providing this kind of economic relief? 30 seconds. Well, the economic relief was critical. Every economist said if we didn't respond and respond with a bold uh, stimulus package that we would have an economic meltdown on top of a public health crisis. So that's what the CARES Act was all about. And that's what the HEROES Act is as the numbers climb heading into the fall and the cold weather. Um, again, we need to tackle deficits the way we do, which is economic activity. But it's really the whole from the Trump tax cut that my opponent supports and believes in that did not create stimulus for New Hampshire, mm -hmm. for small businesses here, but really rewarded the wealthiest mm -hmm. corporations that don't pay any tax at all, as we've seen from our president. And, and Mr. Negron, I do want to give you some time to sure. address what the congresswoman said about your, uh, your support of the pre uh, president Trump's tax cuts. But I did want to ask first, um, because you have made a federal deficit uh, a major goal in your campaign, yes. attacking the federal deficit. Uh, and on the exchange in August, you said federal spending was out of control. Yeah. Uh, in August, the federal deficit hit a new record, record high of $3 trillion under President Trump's administration. You've said we need to rein in spending. So what specifically would you cut to rein in spending? You have 60 seconds. Sure. Well, thank you. Well, let me go back to the stimulus package. And, you know, um, the congresswoman wants to talk about, you know, helping small businesses and, and helping those people in need. And I agree with that. And absolutely, that's what these stimulus packages should be. But when you have this out-of-control spending by the Democrats because they can't get it in, in any other way, you know, I don't need to have $25 million, a billion dollars to some uh, performance center. I don't need to have mandatory um, training at corporate board levels. If it doesn't fix COVID-19 issues, it shouldn't be in the package. And so this HEROES Act and all these things that they want to run around and take a victory lap on, um, it's disingenuous. I mean, those things did not help the COVID-19 at all. Um, as far as deficit reduction, um, there are some things in there. You know, my primary background is in the Department of Defense, and I believe not only in the DOD but in other federal agencies there is glut. I think you have to take a sharp pencil to do those things. And for those savings, instead of more spending, let's look at the savings and apply that. And I think that's how you get a handle on national debt. 
And uh, Congresswoman Custer, I see you wanted to respond to yeah, that. Yeah, I just wanted the PPP loans were also available for nonprofits across the state of New Hampshire, organizations that are critical to our economy, including performing arts centers. I support the Save Our Stages, which would include uh, the Capital Center for the Arts, the, the um, Colonial Theater over in Keene, so many places, performing centers that are critical to our uh, hospitality and tourism economy, which is number two to manufacturing in this state and took the biggest hit. That's funny, though. We can have these these monies for these uh, entities, but in the beginning, we weren't even allowed to go to them. So I don't understand how you put money into something, that's but the then tell us. That's the entire point. So you that's exactly. I agree with you absolutely. And keep One of the, time, the employees no, no, on. I do. That's right. But you payroll. have to do it to a certain for, uh, function, just like your business. The way absolutely. you did it for your business. And keep it's a them small going. run. Absolutely, it's a small run. It's not to be dependent on government spending, and that's this what is you propose. Let, let's allow uh, uh, Mr. Negron to, to finish his it point. It is. It is about you know, give me as my company did, take the PPP loan, get my company back on its feet, and get me off of the loan program. We want to continue to those do those things. And I think the way we get this country back is get the economy back open, stop pandering fear, let the county get back open. And I think that's how we fix our problems specifically here in our state. Let's turn now to a question from a listener. And this is Barbara from Bradford. As a parent, I know how important quality child care is and how hard it is to come by right now. And parents often can't work without it. But child care providers in our community are struggling just to keep their doors open. What will you do to help this critical sector during this crisis? Let's start with you this time, uh, Mr. Negron, 60 seconds. Absolutely. Well, I'm, um, I used to be on uh, the board of directors uh, for World Academy in Nashville, New Hampshire, which is, does child care as well as education through um, eighth grade. Um, and a dear friend of mine um, is also a director of a, a daycare in, in Nashua. So I understand this problem completely. Uh, We absolutely know that for parents to be able to go and provide for their families, they have to go to work um, once we get this economy back open. And so we need to make sure that we have provisions in there to allow daycare providers to be able to open up the daycare so that parents can take um, full advantage of that. Um, Lacking that, you know, we as parents, and I had it when I was younger, my children were younger. Um, We had to make decisions sometimes, but we were fortunate enough to be able to have daycare. It needs to be affordable daycare, but we need to have um, policies in place to allow daycare daycares here in New Hampshire the opportunity to open safely with all the precautions so that parents can put their children in a safe place so they can go back to work. Congresswoman Custer, you have 60 seconds. Absolutely. I've supported the funding both in the CARES Act and in the HEROES Act. In fact, I've supported legislation for $100 million in uh, excuse me, $100 billion in child care. And I'm surprised with Mr. DeGrand's answer because he's opposed to the HEROES Act. He's opposed to further spending. And I think child care is the best example. One in four women across this country are leaving the workplace. They've either reduced their hours or they've left their jobs completely. That's an incredible brain drain for our economy. But the stress on families is just too much. We had 13 teletown halls last spring during the shutdown during Chris Pappas and I, and we heard from numerous families about the strain that they were under. It's a critical issue, and we've got to address it, and that's why I support the funding. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Laura. We're going to take a very quick break, everyone. Thank you for that first segment. Coming up, we'll talk about the Affordable Care Act, also law enforcement and race. Stay with us. Keep it right here for more of our second congressional district debate. This is The Exchange on NHPR. Listening to NHPR News from New Hampshire and NPR. The Senate Judiciary Committee has begun its confirmation hearings for U.S. Supreme Court nominee Amy Coney Barrett. NHPR will carry NPR's live special coverage of the hearings along with analysis from NPR reporters. Coverage resumes this morning at 10 on NHPR News from New Hampshire and NPR. 
Support for NHPR comes from you, our listeners, and from New England College, where civic engagement, community involvement, and academic programs for tomorrow come together today. Information at nec.edu slash civic engagement. And from Capital Roofing, offering installation and repair of residential roofs throughout New Hampshire. More CapitalRoofingNE.com. Cloudy some rain today, high temperatures in the 50s, cloudy rain this evening, clearing in the overnight, lows tonight, lower 40s. You're listening to NHPR, news from New Hampshire and NPR. Welcome back to NHPR's candidate debate for New Hampshire's second congressional district. I'm Laura Canoy, along with Peter Biello, and we're sitting down with the Republican nominee, former state lawmaker and businessman Steve Negron, and the Democratic incumbent, Congresswoman Ann McClain Custer. And both of you, let's turn now to the Affordable Care Act with a case coming up before the U.S. Supreme Court next month. Supreme Court nomination hearings underway right now on Capitol Hill. Congresswoman Custer, you first. You have said the ACA isn't perfect. That's why you're trying to make it better. I'm quoting you there. But many of your fellow Democrats support a Bernie Sanders style government health care system like Medicare for all. They say it's time to replace this law with something bigger. What kind of system do you favor, Congressman Custer, and why? 60 seconds, please. Sure. There's a middle ground. We can certainly improve upon the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the Republicans and this president are rushing through a Supreme Court justice in order to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Every voter needs to know that on November 10th, just one week after the election, there is already scheduled an oral argument in the Republican effort to completely repeal the Affordable Care Act. That would mean that pre-existing conditions would not be covered by uh, health insurance companies, including COVID, but asthma, allergies, cancer, diabetes, all the rest. So I support a very thorough plan like what we have, but we can expand it. There are people who fall through the cracks. And some people might choose a Medicare program. I say Medicare for all who want it. If you want that type of program, you should have that choice. But many, many Granite Staters get their health insurance through their employer, and that's their preference. They would prefer private insurance through the employer. And so I think we can find that balance and make sure everyone is covered. Well, and Congresswoman, medicine costs are on many, many listeners in minds. Maryland and Pembroke wrote us saying, Americans pay the highest prescription drug prices in the world. If elected, how will you cut prescription drug prices for all Americans? 30 seconds, please, Congresswoman. Thank you, Marilyn. And I couldn't agree more. And that's why I have voted for the Democratic bill in the House that cut prescription drug prices across the board. But Mitch McConnell in the Senate never even took that up. So this is one of the very first issues in the Biden administration when we take this increase our uh, numbers in the House, take back the Senate, and take back the White House, will lead with lower prescription drug prices. And it's a key priority for Granite Staters, not just seniors, but for anyone that needs medication for their health and well-being. Why has not the Affordable Care Act lowered prescription drug prices? It doesn't seem like they're any more affordable than they were 10 years ago when the law was signed. They were going up very fast. They were going up very fast before that. So I think there was a leveling off. But I think the pharmaceutical industry has certain breaks from previous administrations that we need to roll back. Most particularly under Medicare Part D, they don't We don't, the government, negotiate a volume discount. That was way back to President George Bush, and it's something that, again, we need to take up in a Biden administration. We should be negotiating a volume discount so that not just seniors but also taxpayers pay lower prescription drug prices. Thank you, Congresswoman. (coughs) And uh, Mr. Negron, to you, please. You have said that, quote, the cost of health care is one of my highest priorities and that innovation, competition, and transparency would help. Beyond these general principles, Mr. Negron, please give us two specific changes that you would promote in Congress that would significantly lower costs. Absolutely, Laura. Well, the first 60 thing seconds. I, sure. Um, I want to correct something Congresswoman Custer said. She says that I don't support the Heroes and Cares Act. I do support the Heroes and Cares Act. What I don't support is the frivolous spending that are included in those bills. I just wanted to get that straight. Um, so, yeah, you know, we have some things out there. You know, right now in New Hampshire, I think it's like 2.5 um, insurance plans are offered here in the state. We need to lower the barriers to entry so that anybody can come in that's a qualified uh, supplier of health care to come into our state. You know, we go across state lines to buy our home insurance and to buy our auto insurance and boat insurance. I do not know why we can't do that for health care. 
Um, but the number one thing we need to realize, Laura, is that the government has to get out of the business of health care. Um, it's been a uh, it hasn't done everything that was supposedly promised in the Obama administration, like the cost of prescriptions. You know, Congresswoman Custer has been in there eight years. And then you said earlier the cost has gone up um, only now in the election cycle. Is it now a factor to try to bring costs down? So I think bringing down the barriers to entry and uh, letting health providers and health care insurers come across state lines was one of the first things I look at doing. Mr. Negron, as you know, New Hampshire's Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act had bipartisan backing when it passed and is still supported by the governor and the state's leading business organization, the BIA. How do you feel about Medicaid expansion, Mr. Negron? In 30 seconds, please. Sure. Anytime that you say expansion, you know, we talk about spending. So I would have to look at that. If it provides a service and an ability for some of our our folks to use uh, Medicaid expansion for a finite period of time, it doesn't go at infinitum, then I would certainly look at that. Look, we have a health care crisis in this country, and we have to look at options that bring down health care. It's about accessible to health care, accessibility and affordability. And if Medicare expansion provides that in a limited run, then that's something I would absolutely consider. And Mr. Negron, if the Affordable Care Act is repealed with this lawsuit coming before the high court next month, it could affect the coverage of tens of thousands of Granite Staters. What is your message to those people who may be worried they are going to lose their health care? 30 seconds, please. Absolutely. The one thing that the message to New Hampshire Granite Staters is this administration is not about taking away your health care. It is about providing health care um, currently right now that's going to be cost affordable. Look, I had a person yesterday that told me about underneath the uh, Obamacare or uh, ACA, her EpiPen prescription went up almost ten t- tenfold. That's not what the ACA is supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be about bringing access and cost down. Um, right now, uh, if, in fact, the ACA is repealed, we need to make sure that we have something that's more affordable and more accessible uh, for the great folks of, the, of New Hampshire. Congressman Laura, Custer, 30 could, seconds. <clears throat> if I could jump in there, there is no Republican plan. We've been hearing uh, this rhetoric for years, and it doesn't exist. And I know that his Republican colleagues do not support coverage for pre-existing conditions because I had the great honor in our Democratic caucus to carry that bill. I'm on the health subcommittee of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and it was my bill to guarantee coverage for pre-existing conditions, and virtually all of my Republican colleagues voted against that bill. Um, Mr. Negron, do Republicans have a plan? They do. As a matter of fact, um, we, had, seconds. we had one, um, and it wasn't passed in the Senate by one vote. We all know how that happened. Um, and, you know, it's really funny to me when you have somebody vo- vocalize that we will cover pre-existing conditions, but yet the rhetoric and this hyper-partisanship says that we're not. I don't know what you have to do to lead, you know, a horse to water. Um, we actually do want to cover pre-existing conditions. It's just a talking point from the left. Um, I uh, reject that um, in its entirety, and I think we shouldn't be passing on stuff that's not true. Well, we could do many more hours right. on this topic. <laughs> I am going to move on and throw it back to Peter. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, and let's turn now to the issue of policing and racial bias. Uh, and we'll start with you, Mr. Negron. Yes. Uh, you've previously rejected the idea of systemic racism. The research points to its existence. And for example, uh, researchers from Northeastern and Harvard University shows that black and Hispanic Americans are far more likely to be victims of police violence. So what policy changes, if any, would you make to address this disparity? You have 60 seconds. Well, thank you, Peter. Well, first off, I'm the only one up here that is Hispanic. Um, my life is not a study. My life isn't about um, taking a poll. My life is living it over the last 59 years. And so I, I wholeheartedly refute this idea of systemic racism because the very simple question is, are we better today? Are we perfect? No, sir. But are we better today than we were in 1950? I can tell you my father who grew up in New York City will tell you absolutely. Are we better than we were in 60 and 70? The issue is, is that law enforcement has to have the ability to do their job. And we shouldn't make this the divisive issue that the, the Democrats want to make it all the time. You know, uh, Congresswoman Custer... Push a, put a bill out about the George Floyd, about getting rid of qualified immunity, you know, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. You know, that's not somebody that's supporting law enforcement. Uh, law enforcement needs to do their job. Um, and I believe that, you know, me as a Hispanic, I do not uh, in, in my life have seen um, a couple of instances of, of prejudice. But to uh, have it as a indictment against our country, um, I don't believe it. I've lived it. I know what it is. I can speak better than anybody else on this topic. And so anybody else that comes out and talks to me about what racism is, is just a talking point from a white sheet of paper. Let me ask you uh, a follow up question on that, Mr. Negron, because you said that we are not perfect. Yes, sir. Um, does that mean that more needs to be done? And if so, 
what more needs to be done? Absolutely. You know, one of the things we talk about in the military are the things called TTPs, or Training Technique and Procedures. And in all the police officers that I've talked about, not only in New Hampshire, but in South Carolina and Texas, where I have friends that are in law enforcement, is you're always striving to do better. You're always striving to do the right thing for everyone, not just one single populace. And so I think that that's what they have to do when they find things that is not effective or doesn't work. They change that. And I think we have to have law enforcement have the ability to do those things and not mandate it from Washington because Washington doesn't know how to do law enforcement at all. And so do you support uh, systemic bias training for both police and prosecutors? Um, no, because systemic bias uh, training is saying that we have an indictment and we have a problem. I've already gone on record saying that we don't have that problem. Do we have to have individuals that need to be retrained? Absolutely. But that's the function of the police department, not the function of government telling us what to do. And uh, Congresswoman Custer, will put this next question to you um, on the subject of qualified immunity for police officers and the removal of it. Some in law enforcement are concerned about that. They say that it puts police officers' families at financial risk. Uh, uh, what would you say to those people? Well, first of all, I'm totally surprised by the answer because New Hampshire can serve as a model. And this is uh, Governor Chris Sununu's own commission that uh, met 26 times. I've spoken with a number of members of the commission, including more recently with Commissioner Quinn, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, Commissioner Quinn from Department of Safety, who led that, that effort. Um, they put out 48 recommendations and they address exactly implicit bias, ethics, and de-escalation training. They're changing the standards and training for police here in New Hampshire to recognize that implicit bias training that's so necessary, and accountability. What I've learned from the police, and I want to give a particular shout out to Chief Kerrigan down in Nashua, who has done an extraordinary job with these racial issues. He's had a community dialogue going for six years. It's not really a question about immunity. That's not the focus. The focus is on having accountability. The focus mm -hmm. is on making sure that, and the, I learned these words from mm -hmm. these people, a, the, a good cop does not want a bad cop to ruin their reputation. And if you mm -hmm. saw the death of George Floyd, as millions of Americans did, you know that there's a problem. People are dying. The, the data is very clear. Mm -hmm. And so we need to make sure that through training, implicit bias training, through accountability, that we improve community policing. And that's the entire goal of the commission, and I applaud their work. Let me ask you again about qualified immunity, because another problem with it that uh, some have expressed is that it would dissuade people from uh, wanting to become police officer in, officers in the first place. And some police departments across New Hampshire are already having trouble uh, recruiting enough qualified candidates. So so how would you address those concerns that this is a disincentive to become a police officer in the first place? Well, here's the point. We need to start the conversation somewhere. And what I believe is that it should be an honorable profession. The reason that it's difficult to recruit is that they don't have the accountability. I'm an attorney. We have ethics. We have rules. And if there's a bad attorney, they are reprimanded and there is accountability. And that's what we're looking for. And of the police that I've spoken to and law enforcement and first responders, they want accountability. They want to know that the person that they're working next to has had the training, the de-escalation training, so that they don't get into a dangerous situation. It's dangerous for the other police that are responding if one person overreacts and creates a, a more volatile situation. Mm -hmm. Laura? If, if I may, Laura, that's, oh, you know, that's uh, 30 30 seconds. just quickly, absolutely. You know, what I hear Congresswoman Custer saying is an indictment against the police force and law enforcement. Um, and the police that I've talked to um, reject that wholeheartedly. If there's a police officer that does something wrong, then they take care of it, and that individual may actually be asked to leave the department and then um, barred so that he can never join a police force again. You know, what happened to George Floyd, um, certainly um, as, as bad as that was, does not make an indictment against law enforcement. And so all of a sudden we now have this knee-jerk reaction to try to say that every cop is like that and that nobody wants to join the police force because of bad cops. That's not some, something that I share. And I can tell you, having just received the New Hampshire Police Association's endorsement, it's not something that they share either. Well, and Congressman Custer, I did want to give you 30 seconds since we're talking about police and law enforcement. What is your reaction to this endorsement that Mr. Negron just mentioned? I'm thrilled to have 
the endorsement of EMTs and EMS and firefighters and first responders. Look, I think what we want is to make sure that our community is safe. And right now, all across this country, we have people who don't feel safe in their community. They don't feel that they can reach out to the police to resolve conflict in their community. What I support is much more of this community policing approach that this New Hampshire commission endorsed. And they endorsed the implicit bias training. They endorsed the ethics training. They endorsed the de-escalation training. And that's the police that I speak to. That's what they want. And okay. that's where they are. Mr. Negron, uh, the endorsement, clearly that's a benefit for you. What are your thoughts, though, about what the congresswoman says on um, the idea that, you know, some members of our community are afraid to call the police Ab- because of what we've seen. Sure, absolutely. 30 seconds, you know, please. You bet. Um, but, but here's the bigger issue is that we've seen this unrest in Seattle. We've seen this unrest in Portland, Kenosha, and Rochester, New York. Um, and one thing we haven't heard is Congresswoman Custer condemning those actions. You know what? Those people are not allowed to call police. And the situation is in our state, in our neighborhoods, in our towns, they want to be able to call that. They still call that. Isn't anybody not calling 911? And those people are there um, to respond because they know that that is um, their job um, as a law enforcement officer. Um, it's great that the firemen and the EMS uh, support Congresswoman Custer. I'm talking to the law enforcement people that disqualified immunity actually uh, uh, affects directly. Okay, Congresswoman, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to respond to that, and then we're going to move on. Thank sure, you. Sure, no problem. I think Mr. DeGraw needs to spend more time in the community. To say that no one is afraid to call 911 just simply isn't correct. And what I've learned from the conversations in Nashua with Chief Kerrigan and this community group that he's brought together, Representative Linda Gathright and others from the end. ACP, um, is that we need an approach around racial profiling, around implicit bias. We need to understand when a policeman responds to a community, are they engaged in understanding of that community? Because there are absolutely okay. people right here in New Hampshire who don't dare call 911. And I want to ask one more question around race, but less around policing. And Congresswoman Custer, as you know, the pandemic itself, the health effects have hit Black and Latinx Americans very hard. Uh, Black Americans, according to the CDC, two and a half times more likely to be infected with COVID-19 than white Americans. Name two specific actions, Congresswoman, that you've taken or that you'd like to see taken to alleviate this disproportionate suffering that we're seeing. And I apologize, I can only give you 30 seconds on this one. Well, it would absolutely be the national testing plan to make sure that these communities that have been disproportionately hit, and then I'd really love a few more minutes uh, to talk about the vaccine, but we can get to it. My role is in focusing on the uh, equitable distribution of the vaccine, making sure that we get to communities of color, uh, seniors, nursing homes, rural communities, communities that have been hit very hard to make sure that everyone has access to the vaccine. So that's something I'm working on right now. Well, thank you. And I know you. I'm giving both of you a very short time <laughs> to digest a very large issue. But, Mr. DeGrand, given the data showing higher rates of infection and death from COVID-19 in black and brown communities, what specific steps would you take as a congressman, if any, to address this disproportionate impact that health officials are seeing? Well, uh, that's 30 seconds, please. You bet. Well, I think the reason why you have this disproportion is in the living conditions that they're in, in the inner cities. And so, you know, you look at these inner cities, I think it's the top 12 or 14 that are Democrat run is actually suppressed and oppressed black people and, and brown people. And so I would be up there to give them opportunities to get out of that situation, to have a better life, to get out in the open and not live on one on top of each other. And I think that's what I would do is find a way to educate and give these guys opportunities to get out of the situation that they're in right now that Democrats have put them in. Thank you, Mr. Negron. We're heading into a quick break, but stay with us for more conversation with New Hampshire's second district congressional candidates right here on New Hampshire Public Radio. Membership contributions and local business support fuel the day-to-day work of NHPR. 
But there's another way to give that ensures a lasting future for public radio here in the Granite State. It happens when you make a gift through your will. Hi, I'm Sarah Alger, Director of Plan Giving. By including NHPR as a beneficiary in your estate plan, you ensure future generations will have access to the integrity-based news and information that means so much to you. Learn more at nhpr.plangiving.org. Support for NHPR comes from you, our listeners, and from Granite State College, offering accredited bachelor and master's degree programs in nursing and healthcare management. Registration and information at granite.edu. And from White Point, committed to human service, child advocacy, and social impact, Election Day is November 3rd, waypointnh.org. Cloudy with some rain today, high temperatures in the 50s. You're listening to NHPR, news from New Hampshire and NPR. Welcome back, everyone, to NHPR's candidate debate for New Hampshire's 2nd Congressional District. I'm Laura Canoy, along with Peter Biello, and our candidates are Steve Negron. He's a former state lawmaker and businessman. He's the Republican nominee and also Democratic Congresswoman Anne McLean Custer. And, Peter, let's begin this last segment with you, please. Let's talk about climate change, and we'll go to you first, Mr. Negron. Uh, The vast majority of climate scientists agree that the climate is changing and human beings are causing it. How do you envision climate change impacting your district, and what can you, as a member of Congress, do about it? You have 60 seconds. Thank you, Peter. Um, You know, one of the things of being a scoutmaster, and I was a scoutmaster with my Troop 410 in in Nashua for over 15 years, is I took um, the young men um, almost to every mountain, uh, across almost every stream, and actually canoed almost every lake. Um, And this is a beautiful state of ours. I mean, we need to make sure that we protect that and preserve that for future generations going forward. And so I would look at legislation that helps us protect the natural beauty of the great state of New Hampshire. Um, but we need to do that in a, in a judicious way. We need to make sure that we're um, methodical in our approach. Nobody wants to take a beautiful state like ours and not leave it better. We have a program in Scouts called Leave No Trace. And it's about when you find an area of beauty, you leave it better than when you found it. And so that's something I subscribe to. Um, what I don't subscribe to necessarily is this um, really kind of this pendulum swing of doing these really onerous kind of things in a fashion that I think would hurt the state of New Hampshire because it's not in a thoughtful, methodical way. But one thing is, is clear. Um, just like this beautiful fall weekend this past weekend, the trees were on fire. And that's what I want people to come who live in New Hampshire or people to come and visit to still maintain it going forward in the future. And let me ask you specifically, what would you do to protect those uh, beautiful landscapes that you describe? Is there a specific policy that you think would be effective in protecting those things? Um, I I think there would be, um, Peter. I would make sure that, for example, that we keep our waterways clear um, and not have them polluted um, with anything. I think we look at our hiking trails. We look at our deforestation program. I think there are things that are out there that we can do to make sure that we maintain this great state. Uh, What I don't want to do is just have this overreaction. But let's get to the point that I want to be able to enjoy this great state for the many, many years that I have remaining. Um, and also people coming behind us to do those kind of same kind of things that I did. A lot of the talk about uh, climate change and the economy in particular is the creation of clean jobs. Do you believe uh, the government should provide incentives, if not mandates, for clean energy development and job development? Sure. If there's an incentive for us, you know, and I'm a big proponent of renewable energy. Um, and so if there are ways that we can incentivize companies and businesses um, to be able to use clean energy, um, whether it's through the tax code or um, through loans or grants or whatever the case may be, I would be in favor of that um, because I think the long, long-term long fix would be um, making sure that we have our, our state. And it's also an incentive for a business uh, to be able to do those things. But that would be a decision based on the business's role and what they want to do in conjunction with whatever program they would want to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And let's turn to you, Congresswoman Custer. Uh, You've expressed support for committees looking into the Green New Deal. Do you support the Green New Deal? And if so, what parts of it would you prioritize putting into action if reelected? You have 60 seconds. Well, I don't. It was never put into legislation. What I support is my clean energy agenda, and that's on our website, custer.house.gov. And we've laid out the response to climate change. Uh, Mr. Negron never mentioned reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's carbon dioxide that the scientists have identified are creating the warming of our uh, climate around the globe, not just here in New Hampshire. We're not an island. So the fires in the West, the 
hurricanes in the south, the extreme drought that our farmers are struggling with right now in New Hampshire. I agree with you about clean jobs. I think it's a jobs and opportunity approach that I've taken with incentives for clean energy. Right here in New England, the offshore wind is going to be a tremendous boost to our economy and working with companies on that as well. Um, and I want to make sure that everybody benefits from it. So we have a number of companies here that will create jobs, uh, build our economy, and save our planet. It's a win-win-win. Congresswoman Custer, is there a particular policy or a piece of legislation that you would support that you believe would be successful in lowering greenhouse gas emissions? Absolutely. And again, I'm on the Energy and Commerce Committee, on the Energy Subcommittee, and I'm signing on to uh, it's Diana DeGette's legislation, and it has clean energy standards and further incentives. We'll be working with the Ways and Means Committee and our Energy Subcommittee. Um, this will be a big priority in the Biden administration, and some Something to look forward to in January when we will be enacting legislation to make up for the past four years. Uh, I, I support the president getting back into the Paris Climate ag Agreement and making sure that we're focused. We can't afford to lose another year uh, to climate change. It's too devastating to people's lives and to our economy. Uh, Mr. Negron, I'll put the question to you since uh, Congresswoman Custer mentioned sure. that the Paris Climate Accord would you support the re-entry of the United States into that accord? Uh, no, no, I wouldn't. And I think I heard uh, Congressman Custer saying the president wants to go back to the Paris Climate Accords, and he doesn't. Um, look, no, we've President Biden right. well, would that's, want that, to go back to the. That's what I was speaking okay. about, President Biden. Um, that's a long way off. Um, one of the issues that we have is that we've actually reduced, the United States has reduced its CO2 emissions organically. Um, without a Paris Accord uh, agreement out there. So, you know, if you want to talk about reducing organic or reducing CO2, you look, you need to look at the two largest offenders. You need to look at China, you need to look at India. Um, you get those people in, in place, and I think then from a global perspective, then we'll be doing better. Uh, but we're doing it on our own. Do you believe that there is a policy that the United States should enact to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Mr. Negron, 30 seconds. I don't know if a policy is something that I would um, look at, but you know, companies are doing it on their own, Peter. Um, this is, again, is you know, we, we know that, that that's a situation that's out there, and we're reducing our CO2 emissions organically, so something's working without policy. So I think that's what we, we need to look at, how our companies doing this on our own without having to do into some international agreement that doesn't hold any enforcement mechanisms. Thank you very much, Mr. Negron. Laura. Thank you, Peter. Let's talk about voting, both of you. Congresswoman Custer, as you know, many states, including New Hampshire, have made it a lot easier to vote absentee. For voters who are concerned about the virus, they can stay away from the polls. But President Trump has suggested repeatedly, without evidence, that this could make the outcome, in his words, fraudulent. What is your message to Granite Staters, Congresswoman, who feel unsafe going to the polls, but also really want their vote to count? 60 seconds, please. Well, absolutely. And the good news is you can vote right now. I voted already last week in Hopkinton. Go to your town hall or city clerk, and you can fill out the application for an absentee ballot. Fill out the ballot right then and there and hand it back to the town clerk, and your vote will be counted. And best of all, you can track your ballot online at the Secretary of State's office so you know that it's been delivered. If you choose to vote by mail, you can send your ballot by mail, but we've been advised by the Postal Service that you should send it at least one week before the election. And of course, if you do chose to appear in person on election day, we've been assured by town clerks across the state that they will do their best to keep physical distancing, uh, encourage masks, and keep you safe while you vote. And Mr. Negron, President Trump last month indicated if he loses, he might not abide by the outcome of the election based on this unsupported claim of election fraud. He's also told his supporters to, quote, watch closely at the polls, raising concerns about voter intimidation, especially among minority groups. What message is this language from the president, Mr. Negron, sending to second district voters? Well, thank you, Laura. Um, I certainly I don't believe that the president is not going to abide. And you have but, 60 seconds here, by oh, the way. Thank you. Just want to reset um, the clock. Phew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that the president is saying that, you know, that he's not going to abide by but the outcome of the election. You know, it's interesting that Congresswoman Custer wants people to go to City Hall and to the town clerks and to get an absentee ballot. And I don't see the difference then going to go and vote in person. Um, look, I sat on the election law committee in this great state of New Hampshire in the, in the legislature. Uh, we have the best secretary of state in Bill Gardner. Um, he's done some phenomenal things to make sure that people are, are, are allowed to vote. 
Um, and people are going to do that. Um, when I talk to people, there are people that I know that have voted early um, through the absentee program, and that's what it's for. You know, they opened up the aperture to allow people with the, with the issue of COVID-19 to vote. Um, look, um, I've been in this state now for 31 years um, and voted. Um, the people are going to do the right thing. For those that want to go and vote and actually cast their ballot per the constitutional right, they're going to do that. Other people are going to mail it in. But I know at the end of the day on November 3rd that the voters in the great state of New Hampshire are going to do what's right for them, and I support them. Peter, back to you. We're going to close out with a couple more questions from our listeners. And for these, we'll take 60 seconds, depending on how it goes, follow-ups or not. Um, So, Peter, you go ahead first, please. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, Sean from Nashua asks, what is your stance on term limits in the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate? Mr. Negron, we'll start with you. Absolutely. 60 well, seconds. Thank you, Peter. I sir, I signed a term uh, term limit pledge uh, last time in 18 and again in 20. Um, it's clear to me that Congress was never intended to be a, uh, a lifetime position. Um, it was never supposed to be something that you continued on um, well past, I think, the usefulness of, of your term. Um, and so I believe that you need to go to Washington for those of the, those of us who are fortunate to go um, and to do your time and to come back. You know, the, it was always envisioned that you did some time in, the, in, in Congress and then you came home and you became a farmer. And you went back to your hospital practice or whatever the case may be. Um, it was never intended to be a career. Um, and I believe that's something that we've lost. I think you see some people in there. Um, that are in way too long. They've lost contact and touch with their district because they spend more time in Washington than they do in their home district. And so I am I'm personally am for term limits. Um, I believe that it's time that we get back to that. And so I would support legislation to provide term limits for both the House and the Senate. Uh, Mr. Negron, just a quick follow-up. Uh, how many terms for uh, the House and Senate? And uh, what do you say to those who say that those who stay in Congress for a long time build up experience and knowledge of how the system works. They build up connections and they're able to get things done because of their experience. 30 seconds. You bet. Um, I believe that it's three terms for, for the House and two terms for the Senate. And for those people that stayed there, we see this in the industry all the time. You have somebody that started working there when they were 23. Now they're much older. They're at 60. Um, they're stuck in their ways. Um, you know, there's one way to do it. It's their way. You need to bring uh, new blood. Um, and let's not forget, um, the, not to um, uh, say any uh, derogatory to any congresswoman, it's those people that work in the offices that do a lot of the work, and they're the ones that you could rely on as a new congressperson to help you understand the ropes in Congress, and I think that's why we need to have some change. Thank you very much. Congresswoman Custer, same question to you, 60 seconds. What's your stance on term limits in the House and Senate? Well, I'm certainly open to the discussion, <clears throat> but I don't think that three terms in the House, um, it would really get the job done for the American people. You know, uh, my opponent has said he doesn't understand the role in, of a federal uh, candidate running it, in terms of the state budget. And I think there's a lot of naivete that happens uh, when people first arrive in Congress, and that could be an example of it. What I have seen is that there are people there far too long. I support a candidate, Democratic candidate in Alaska, Lise Galvin, running against Don Young, who's been in Congress for 47 years. And I think I agree with Mr. Nagan. It's not a life term, that's for sure. Um, but Jean Shaheen is running for the third term in the U.S. Senate. She has tremendous expertise, tremendous talent. And it would be a shame for New Hampshire to lose that talent. So um, I'm certainly open to the discussion, but I, I think there's a downside in that you do lose the talent as well. So, uh, Congresswoman Custer, you said that there is a point at which representatives stay in Congress far too long. Do you have a sense of what that point is? Well, I can certainly seconds. say in Alaska, 47 years is too long for Don Young. Um, you know, I think in our, um, my serving in Congress, I've seen committee chairs that have been in Congress for, you know, 10 or 20 years, building up expertise, certainly on the Ways and Means Committee, the tax structure of the federal government, um, in energy and in uh, the Science Committee and other committees where people do build up expertise. It's important to keep that. But, you know, something in the range of of uh, three terms for the U.S. Senate and um, as many terms to get there uh, in the House, perhaps, in the, in the 
12 to 20 year range, you could find a sweet spot where people did have expertise. You wouldn't lose that. Mm -hmm. But I certainly agree that we need turnover. And I was a new member. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been a tremendous honor to serve. And I don't intend to stay for life. We'd love to get one more question from a listener in. And Laura has it. Laura. Back to you. And I'm glad you mentioned the U.S. Senate because we will be talking to the U.S. Senate candidates on Thursday, Gene Shaheen and Corky Messner. So thank you for the opportunity to plug that uh, upcoming debate. (laughs) As you know, there's a discussion on Capitol Hill right now about antitrust legislation aimed at mega companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook and Google. And this next question about that comes from a listener, Bruce, who says partisan media, social media and other American institutions driven by nothing but a desire for money spend their days tearing us apart. What specific actions would you take? Bruce, thanks for the question. And Congresswoman Custer, you get it first. 60 seconds, please. Absolutely. I support a number of the bills that are being uh, recommended right now for us to investigate. I think Congress waited too long in terms of uh, playing a role in these mega corporations, um, Facebook, uh, Twitter and others. You know, when you have the president of the United States and Twitter has to take down the claims that he's making because they're false, I think that you have a situation that's really crossed the lines of what's in the best interest for our country. Um, he's he's tortured our country with his Twitter account for four years. He wants four more years. I think three more weeks is too long. And I think that we should investigate these companies. And I'll be certainly open to legislation about breaking up their monopoly power and uh, making sure that we enforce the antitrust laws that are on the books in America. Mr. Negron, your response, please, to Bruce's question. Thank you, Congresswoman. 60 seconds. Mr. Negron. Uh, Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Bruce. That's a phenomenal question. You know, traditionally, antitrust is to make sure that we don't have monopolies that are out there um, from a profiteering perspective. I think the issue here is even bigger than that. I think we have platforms that are out there that are silencing speech. I think you have platforms that are out there that are really reducing our ability in accordance with the First Amendment to actually have good and open dialogue. I think that's where the antitrust or some sort of mechanism like that has to happen. You know, we see on all these platforms, you know, that depending on what you look in these search engines, you know, they actually target you um, and what you're trying to see and what you want to hear. And I think that that is a disservice to the American people. And I think they absolutely know what they're doing. I think they know that they're actually putting people versus people. It's a shame that in the last election cycle in 2016, I actually saw a divorce happen on Facebook, right, because of some of the information that was going back and forth. So from an antitrust perspective, absolutely, I think it needs to morph to be able to have free speech on both sides of the aisle to let everybody put their position forward and not be uh, squandered by by a platform. And so I agree. Uh, We need to be doing something like that going forward. Wow. Agreement between you and Congresswoman (laughs) Custer right at the end of our debate. (laughs) Absolutely. That's why we want to bring people together to get the job done. (laughs) Well, that's all the time that we have. And I very much want to thank our two candidates for being with us. Former Republican state lawmaker Steve Negron, thank you for your time today. We thank appreciate you, Laura, being with and us. Thank you very much, Peter. And again, Congresswoman, thank you so much. Congresswoman Great. Custer, yeah, thank you for being with us as well. We appreciate Great it. Great to be with you, Laura and Peter, and good to be with you, Mr. Negron. That's second district Congresswoman and McLean Custer. This does conclude our forum with the second congressional district candidates. And in addition to the candidates, I want to thank my colleague, Peter Biello. Also, our partners at New Hampshire PBS and the many NHPR staff members who helped put this event together, including Christina Phillips, RJ Perkins, Dan Colgan, and Michael Brindley. Now, as I said, our next debate is this Thursday, so just two days from now, October 15th, with the candidates for U.S. Senate incumbent Jean Shaheen and Republican nominee Corky Messner. This is The Exchange on New Hampshire Public Radio.